Hello, my name is Lisa Elvin Staltari, and this is my channel, Have Roots, Will Travel. I am a genealogist and a passionate traveler. In this series, I am focusing on the highways and byways of Quebec. We will indeed be doing lots of travel, if only virtually. Now, I want to remind you to subscribe to the channel and click on the notifications alert so you will know when I post new content. This is the third of my Traveling Quebec presentations. Today we'll be exploring the historical buildings and life of Drummondville. Let's get started. We'll begin our tour of Drummondville today where thousands have passed through since 1904. The theme of our day is the people of Drummondville, how they lived. Drummondville train station, I will be um, putting a link to it. And the train station is a very simple building located in the center of town. And I was blessed that my hometown still had a train station that was functioning. As a young adult, I would go back and forth from Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario. And later, when I worked in Montreal, I could jump on the train and be home. There was the bus, of course, but the train remained a wonderful means of transport. My daughter and I visited my parents in just this manner. Arriving from Montreal, the train takes you north to Quebec City or south to Montreal. It is also said, and I just want to point out, that Queen Elizabeth came through here. Um, actually, she was Princess Elizabeth. I think it was like 1951 or 50. I'd have to double check my notes, but it was a big deal. It was a very big deal at the time, and my father and mother would still talk about it. Um, you know, they weren't married, didn't even know each other at the time, but they both were there witnessing it. So it is kind of interesting. Well, you cannot go into Drummondville without witnessing this house. It's kind of in the middle, almost the middle of town. The William Mitchell House is located on St. George Street near the downtown center of Drummondville. It was built in 1894 for William Mitchell, um, who was, you know, he started off as a lumber merchant. He was a builder of the Drummond County Railroad around 1886 and became the mayor of Drummondville from 1898 to 1902. He was then appointed senator in 1904. Uh, Mitchell made a significant contribution to the development, not only of Drummondville, but also of the center of Quebec region. In 1917, Mitchell then sold his property to the Marchessault family, who, who remained with it until 1978, and who carefully preserved the interiors of the house and the grounds. At one point when I was a teenager, a young adult, it the owners of the house at the time made it into some sort of little restaurant. I remember going in, I think it was called the Creperie. I didn't have the appreciation of the history that I do now, but I remember thinking, wow, this is beautiful. It truly was. I remember the hardwood floors. I remember just the way that the, the house was built it was like nothing I had ever seen before. Now we're going to turn our attention to some other houses that are very, very interesting. The Joseph Treffle Caillé residence has such an interesting history. It is now a marvelous Italian restaurant named La Vieille Maison, this old house. And I've, I will be posting a link to the Facebook uh, page to it. Joseph Caillé was a court clerk and county council secretary. This house was built between 1878 and 1884. In 1908, the house was sold to Joseph Ovid Bouillard, who was the Liberal Member of Parliament for the region from 1911 and 1920. He was also Mayor of Drummondville from 1912 to 1914. The next owner was Joseph Ovalie, Ovalat. Mon Plaisir, who took it over and completely renovated it. Mon Plaisir was also the mayor of Germanville from 1918 to 1920 and is best known for his automobile business. One of the largest automobile dealerships still bears his name. By the way, throughout my life, my parents only bought their cars at Mon Plaisir, so I'm very familiar with this name. I just didn't know the link. Now, the next house we're going to look at is Joseph Will Willard um, 
Fouché House. It's located on one of the main streets in Lindsay, just a little bit above the downtown core. This magnificent building um, is was built in 1920 by Joseph Fouché. Um, he was a window uh, and door merchant, and his son, Joseph Wilf Wilfred Fouché, um, who joined him in the business would live here as well until his death in 1967. When I was a teenager, I remember there was a clothing boutique on the first floor. I would climb the stairs and sometimes pause, wondering who had owned this house. I, there's just something about this house that I really connected with. Um, and, and here it is all in its glory. A friend of mine took a picture of this just this past winter. So it, it really does stand the test of time. Now the third and last major house that we're going to be looking at is called Le Domaine Trent, the, the Trent House, and I've also posted a link to it. And this is found just off the Auto Route 20 and exit 181. You can experience one of Drummondville's truly oldest buildings. This house was built by George Trent, who was an officer in the British Army. Shortly after immigrating to Drummondville in 1836, he built this house, which remained in the family until 1963, when the last descendant died. It was then transferred to the Quebec Department of Cultural Affairs. The city of Drummondville took it over in 2004. Guided tours are available from June to September on Wednesdays through Sundays from 10 a.m. to 4.30. Now, I've also posted a link to this as well. Some of the more in other houses we can look at as well, and I will be posting links. They're not quite as, um, you know, prominent in some ways. In some ways they are. Let's have a look. We are now going to look at some of the historical and and different kinds of architecture found in Drummondville. The first one on your left is the 1846 house, one of the earliest that we can find. It was a residence built by Henri Vassal, who was originally from saint françois du lac With his brother-in-law, he eventually would go on to build a large sawmill in 1879 on the banks of St. Francis River, St. François, and of course his house home was right across the street so he could really keep an eye on it. The other house that we're going to look at is the 1858 house and that house was built by Achille David in 1858 and this house has belonged to the David family from 1858 to 2004. Quite remarkable. One of the most interesting houses I came across was the 1860 house. Um, I learned that even before the founding of Drummondville, 1815, the site was owned by Artemis Lord, uh, who owned, um, who operated an inn uh, for travelers who were traveling on the St. Francis River and had to stop. Um, now, in 1827, George Frederick Harriet, you remember, the founder of Drummondville, bought the land from Arte Artemis Lord, and upon his death in 1859, his heir sold it to Robert James Miller. That is who would eventually build a house in 1860. Um, he was the registrar and postmaster in Drummondville. It was inhabited by three generations of Millar, and I just want to point out it is spelled Millar, M-I-L-L-A-R, so in case you're looking for it. And so they owned it until 1977. Really remarkable. I posted a link in the notes section so you could get more information about this house. Then we have the 1882, the Watts House. William John Watts was a lawyer, mayor of Drummondville from 1875 to 1884, and a member of the National Assembly off and on from 1874 to 1901. Um, this house is truly remarkable, and I've also posted a link to it so you can read a little bit more about what he and his wife um, did for the cultural uh, history of Drummondville. And last, I wanted to showcase 
it's something that's not truly historical in the set mine is, but it's not quite as old. But it is the Manoir de Ramond, and it is very um, one of those buildings that you will see when you're driving uh, downtown Drummondville. And it was built in 1927 at the cost of a whopping $35,000. It replaced the first Manoir de Ramond built in 1907, and that burned down in uh, 1927. The new building had 58 rooms. It, it was inspirational in, because some of the standards that they put in there, it was, it was the first electric, completely electrical hotel in North America, if you can believe it. And um, it was an all-electric kitchen, I should say. Uh, and the owner of it was Southern Canada Power. And Southern Canada Power wanted um, a kind of a good hotel to host its clients and prospective um, executives. Also note that 1927 is a very big year in Drummondville. Why? Because Selenese had just come to town. So they also were um, whining and dining, so to speak, um, their people and trying to get them um, to stay and, and work for them. So it became, Manuel Dorman became kind of like, remember I talked about Le Dauphin in episode one? This was the precursor to the, you know, the fancy hotel. Um, when I was a young girl, Le Manuel Dorman was still functioning. Um, and it is important to note that it is very near and dear to my heart because on the east side of the first floor of the Manuel Drummond um, was the Royal Bank. And my mom worked there in the 1950s. I have so many pictures of her at the Royal Bank. She was the executive secretary to the president of the Royal Bank in Drummondville. You know, that was her claim to fame. So that is some of the really interesting um, historical houses. There's so many more, so many more, and I urge you to look at the links that I've provided. It will send you on a, a little tour if you if you wish. Now let's talk about Selenese Square, Le Carré Selenese. Now, of course, as we have seen in previous videos, I talk about uh, Drummondville, and it, it was known for its textile town. Cel Selenese opened its doors, as we talked about, in 1926. This was a major achievement, but we needed to have a place in town that was really um, highbrow, if you will. And so what they did is they built houses for their executives. And this is, you know, a major, um, a major part of Drummondville history. Um, it's why one of the reasons why my great uncle William um, Elvin came to Drummondville from Scotland, and then a few years later, his much younger brother, my grandfather, came to work in the factory. From then on, he met my grandmother, Paulina Anders, and my dad and his four sisters were all born in Drummondville, except for one, actually. Um, my dad would eventually be awarded a scholarship from Selenese to study textile design in St. Hyacinth, and then began work for Selenese in, in 1955. Back in 1926, though, the company was sending their top engineers and managers from other places. They wanted to create company housing that would not only be luxurious, but would be more English in appearance to help these new managers feel more at home. Remember, this was a national um, headquarters, if you will, and they were coming from all over and they weren't French. Um, presumably, this would also be a good way to lure top talent and all of that good stuff. So at the center of the Selenese um, Square is the Selenese Curling Club. My family spent many hours here as, as both my parents were curlers. Santa Claus would come here as well. My brother and I were always uh, excited to go to the curling club. Parties were held here and there were tennis and badminton as well, which I also participated in. We rode our bikes here and marveled at the richness and uh, impressiveness of the architecture. Every once in a while, one of us knew someone who lived in one of these houses and we were thrilled to be able to get inside and check out the amazing homes.
it really is a part of Drummondville that you need to just kind of, it'll take you all the five minutes to tour the houses, but they really are marvelous and really tell the tale of how Drummondville grew up. And with that, we end our third episode of Drummondville. We will be exploring other avenues. And um, in the next video, we're going to be looking at the businesses and industry of Drummondville. So with that, I will bid you goodbye for now or au revoir.